Um, typically, I uh, stand way in the back of the room and let other people do things on the stage. <laughs> um, so this is new for me. Uh, but I want to thank Laura and Framework for having me. Um, I was very surprised when I got the message from Laura asking me to be here um, because I feel a little bit of imposter syndrome being here with this group, um, knowing that so many of these people are highly, highly technical, and I feel like I'm probably the least technical of the people attending today and the people speaking. Um, but I do feel like I have a lot to offer you guys in terms of my knowledge in producing um, and sh sharing how to work with folks like yourself, as well as uh, communicate within uh, different departments. So, uh, slide. Um, watch out, I'm self-taught. Um, how do you become a real-time producer? I don't know, it just happened. Um, I don't know if people are like going to school for this yet. A virtual production is really, really new, um, and it's constantly evolving, so we're kind of making it up as we go. Um, but this is, uh, becoming a producer is something that occurred naturally for me, and it was a series of all the things that happened in my, my career up until this point that allows me to do the job that I do. Um, so I want to share with you guys a little bit of my background so you can understand where I came from, and hopefully that will give you some context as we're going into deeper talking about departments and who we interact with um, to give you an understanding of how, how and why I know how to communicate with these people. Um, so currently I'm an executive producer at All of It Now. Um, on the day-to-day, -day, that means that I manage all of the projects and all of the staffing and all the personalities that come along with it. Um, but when I'm on job site, I can fit a wide variety of roles. I've been a VP producer, I've been a VP supervisor um, de facto before that was a title. Um, I've been a volume UPM, I've been a VAD supervisor. Um, and what I find is that like my range of knowledge on any given day can fit into each one of these different holes. It just depends on the project, it depends on the team that you're working with, it depends on the creatives. Um, so this is like a little timeline of my career. Um, I started at SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, when I was in high school, I was a technical sewer, and I really wanted to be a costume designer. Um, I remember watching like behind the scenes videos of you know, people making movies, talking about how they dress people, and I was like, oh, this is great, this is what I want to do. Once I got to SCAD, um, in the production design program, they ask you to not only do the major that you want, but also fill in on the other departments. So you have perspective of what other people's lives are like. So on the scenic track, you have to work as a carpenter and a props master. On the lighting track, you work as an electrician or a lighting designer. Um, so the first job they put me on was as a master carpenter, or assistant master carpenter, and I was no good at that. I was a little bit too afraid of power saws. Um, after that, they put me on a lighting crew, and like a little bit of like magic happened where I was like, oh wow, this is the combination of art and science that I never knew existed. And I was a kid who went and took like physics and calculus in high school and then went to art school and never had to take a math or science class ever again. So finding lighting was, was something eye-opening for me that I never expected to find, never had any interest in it prior. Um, so once I, once I was at SCAD for a year, I switched majors um, within the same production design department, but um, went to studying lighting design um, and upon uh, graduation and uh, while I was still in school, I had an internship with PRG um, doing CAD drafting. Um, so learning um, how to draw out ground plans, I worked in lighting previs, um, helping concert touring lighting designers previsualize their shows. Um, and then from there, I became a lighting coordinator. I worked in permanent installations. I worked in lighting rentals for live television shows, corporate events, um, just anything live. Um, and then you'll see this like big gap in the middle, and that's where I wasn't really happy being a lighting coordinator, and I started playing roller derby, um, <laughs> which brought in a whole other <laughs> range of skill sets, but um, I think that will bleed in a little later as I talk about teamwork. Um, after that, in 2016, um, I was helping PRG with their corporate trade shows, like their internal ones. Um, so that was my first experience working with LED as an environmental lighting source. Um, and then the following year, um, we started doing poor man's process with LED walls and motorcycles. Um, so my job in that was designing the booth, um, helping install it, um, overseeing all the crews that, that put them in, essentially acting as a producer, but with the title of you know, project manager. Um, from there, um, a few years later, I decided to shift careers a little bit and went uh, to be a technical designer, working with Yarun, who's sitting here, will be talking later today. Um, 
what we, uh, what we did as technical designers, uh, we worked a lot with LED and custom LED manufacturing, looking, uh, creating custom rigging solutions for, for LEDs for concert tours and things like that. Um, in 2020, after the pandemic hit, I was lucky enough to keep my job throughout, uh, working as a draftsman and a technical designer. Uh, but in 2020, I had my first XR project. And very similar situation to working on corporate trade shows for PRG, um, was thrown in and kind of had to, to take the lead. I thought I was just gonna oversee the installation of LED and lighting and things like that, but had to step into a role where I was consulting with directors and DPs on how to use the technology. Um, and that was where I was in this like weird VP supervisor role before there was really a, a title for that. Um, after that, um, I did a couple more XR projects and I met Danny Furbo from All of It Now and we worked on a project together and we went through a bunch of battles together. And in the end, I said to Danny, like, do you have like a job for me? Like, I really like working with you. I really like what you guys are doing. I like the energy that you guys bring to the fields. And um, from that, he said, yeah, absolutely. Do you want to go to Saudi Arabia? And I said, no. Um, but if you have another job, like, let, let me know. Um, so I joined Danny. And in 2021, I did my first project with volumetric video. Um, working as a production manager, not on the, the content side of things. It was a lot of me watching dudes tinker with computers and get angry at each other, um, which is also where I learned how to manage those personalities a little bit. Um, in 2022, I had my first broadcast augmented reality project uh, working at Coachella, and we did that again this year, which was a lot of fun. And then in 2023, I had my first project as a VAD supervisor uh, working in ICVFX. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of a trajectory. Um, I'm sure there's other virtual production producers and real-time producers who have very, very different backgrounds, but just wanted to give you some context of where I come from. And so, so as I'm talking about departments later, you know um, why I might know those things. This will be a quick slide. Um, just talking about uh, real-time production and virtual production. I'm not gonna talk about XR today because like, we're standing on an XR stage and I'm pretty sure you guys know what a Freston is. Um, but I will talk a little bit about ICVFX. Um, so this past winter, I got the opportunity to work at the Fuse and MBS stage in Bethpage, Long Island, um, which is a massive, massive volume. Um, it's, we spent, I think, four months there. Um, it was a long time. Um, but talking about ICVFX, we had real-time content playing back on, on screens for film production, um, doing both uh, 2D plates as well as um, full Unreal Engine scenes. Um, the, my heart is in augmented reality. Um, so what we do at All of It Now is we work um, with broadcast AR. Uh, when you talk to people about AR, a lot of them will take out their cell phone and be like, Snapchat, Instagram filters. And we're like, kind of. <laughs> um, so what we do is we take it up a level and we do augmented reality for live streams and broadcast. Um, we uh, add tracking devices to broadcast cameras and um, add AR graphics, uh, 3D content, on top of the raw camera feed to make a composite that is a more beautiful, magical experience. Um, here, pictured here is uh, Disney's Encanto at the Hollywood Bowl that we did uh, last November and got nominated for four Emmys, which is really exciting, um, including uh, outstanding technical direction and camera work. Um, which I think is the closest thing that augmented reality could be considered for. Um, and what you'll notice here on the screens, um, there's IMAG screens on either side. So this was a two-fold project for us. Not only did we do real-time playback of AR for the people in the audience to see what was going on, as well as we did post renders, uh, 4K post renders for the broadcast that went to Disney Plus as well. So a, a, a pretty thick pipeline. Um, this is also a project that we pitched ourselves. Um, we went to Disney and said, hey, we heard you're doing this. We think we can make it cooler. Um, so this was like probably one of my more exciting projects and one of my favorites. Um, talking about ICV effects and AR, what I really want you guys to take home today is that ICV effects and AR are not that different. Um, very similar staffing, very similar workflows, same technology, um, and I consistently produce these two project, these two types of projects with the same team. Um, so we'll go on set and, and do both. Um, ICV effects and AR both use track camera and real-time graphics. Um, and those are like the two major components um, of them. 
ICVFX and AR are kind of inverted, whereas with ICVFX, we're projecting a background behind the talent, whereas AR, we're projecting the graphics on top of the raw camera feed, so in front of the talent. Uh, just a little bit about all of it now. We're a, t a small team of designers, show programmers, technical artists, technologists, and just really smart humans who love what they do. Um, the common thread throughout all of our work is real-time content. Um, we very rarely work with anything that's pre-rendered. So we like to, to keep it as live as possible. Um, this um, is an image from Unreal Engine. Um, I think they use this for film production, but um, I blacked out a couple of things um, because this is the All of It Now pipeline. This is where All of It Now fits within the spectrum of virtual production. So we can fill any of these roles that are featured here um, as much or as little as the pipeline as a project requires. So sometimes we're just doing creative development and we're making content and sending off a scene to a stage to be produced or to be uh, shot. Sometimes we're taking in other people's content, optimizing it, integrating it, um, and then um, executing it on site. Um, and then for things like Encanto, we take that into post and we do our own uh, VFX work as well. Uh, this next slide uh, is about inter departmental interactions. So as a uh, real-time content producer or real-time producer, um, the workflows are the same and the people that you need to talk to are very, very similar. Um, in terms of production, you need to talk to your producers, your EPs about money. You need to talk to your director um, so they know what's, <laughs> what's going on. Um, our, we have a lot of interactions with the art department in terms of um, working in VAD. Um, for AR, art department is a little less, but we do still work with the art directors to make sure that our graphics are in line with, with their vision as well. Um, and then on the ICVFX side, working as VAD, um, working directly alongside the production designers who are telling us how they want their scenes to be built. Um, camera is obvious. Uh, there's always camera crew that you need to work with, uh, first ACs um, and people like that. Um, and then we start to see a split, but I want to draw some parallels between, uh, between these groups. So in ICVFX, you're going to talk to a bunch of engineers who are managing all the, the server room. Um, in the AR side of things, for broadcast, they call this a tech manager. Um, and tech managers are my favorite people <laughs> of all the people that you can work with, because I know that if I ever come to a tech manager with a problem, that they're going to solve it immediately. They don't want a problem on their plate, and they always have a bag of tricks <laughs> to fix whatever, whatever we messed up. Um, in terms of video and LED, ICVFX, we're standing on an LED stage. It requires technicians to, to manage this and make sure that it's working, f functioning properly, as well as when you're on set and you're operating, you can't let your stage go black. Um, a big, big problem for everyone on set, if anything happens at the walls, they all freak out. They think that the sky's falling. Um, and being able to keep your walls up allows them to continue to light things while you're working in the background. So having a close relationship with LED is really important because um, we're constantly asking them to freeze the walls so we can do other things in the background while no one really knows that anything's going wrong. Um, on the AR side, we need to work with, uh, with video. Um, I forget where I was going with that one. Um, but we, yeah, we work with the video teams as well. Um, I'm, oh, in, in terms of projection and LED as well. Um, for in contact with the Hollywood Bowl, um, there was projection, uh, proje they projection mapped the front of the bowl, and all of our AR effects extended out from and was motivated by the projection that was happening. So we work alongside screens producers very often uh, to make sure that our, our looks are cohesive as well. They don't always see what we're doing, but we also need to make sure that we're matching what they're doing. Um, the next one is electrics and lighting. Uh, when you're on a film set, they call it electrics. You have your, gra your gaffer, your best boy. Um, in AR, um, they just call it the lighting department. We work with lighting designers, lighting directors, programmers. Um, on the ICVFX side, it's really important that we talk to them because we have things like installing ring of fire lighting around the top of an LED wall so we can replicate those effects with lighting outside of just using the LED. Um, on the AR side, um, especially thinking about like those particle systems that I showed you earlier with Encanto, we uh, worked with the lighting designer to 
asked them to add some motivated lighting to it. So we add, as the butterflies were coming over, we asked them, hey, can you take a gold wash and kind of graze, sorry, graze this area of, of the audience so that there's a little bit of a, you can see the impact of the glow of the AR features as well. Um, this year we had a really great experience at Coachella working with the gorillas and their lighting team uh, with Matt Pittman. And he was brilliant in <laughs> realizing when his lighting effects were ruining the illusion of the augmented reality graphics. Um, so we worked really closely together to ensure that he never put lights that went directly into the camera that would blow out the lens and make our graphics look funky on top of what was already coming in from the raw camera feed. Um, Grips and staging are the other department that I love, and I think this is because I come from you know, a hands-on production background. Um, grips and riggers are all gritty guys. Um, on the ICVFX side, we need to make sure that they understand when they're messing up with our tracking markers. Um, <laughs> I have threatened many a, of a, a grip uh, to, he has to let me know if he moves that truss. Um, and, if you establish a really nice relationship with these guys, they will let you know as soon as it moves. I remember the last time I was on set, I came in one morning and the truss was down and as soon as the man saw me, he runs over and says, I swear it didn't touch anything. <laughs> so um, having a good relationship with your grips and your staging supervisors is really important. On the AR side, um, it's a little different. We usually don't have as much trouble with tracking markers as much as we do with um, the platforms that our jibs are on. Um, sometimes they wiggle and we need them to like super reinforce them because any, sort of, uh, any sort of wiggle will affect all of our tracking data. Um, on the IC VFX side, we also work with VFX, um, not in the final product, but in ensuring that when they need to do scans of the set, that it's properly lit in the way that they need. Um, I know uh, on, a, on a recent project, I had to take a bigger hand with VFX in making sure that they had exactly what they needed, um, like making sure that things were lit evenly. Um, a lot of times they leave it as like an afterthought and um, yeah, just, just really ensuring that they have a good final product because if we hand off you know, scans that don't look good, then their composites aren't gonna work either. So we wanna make sure that these both match. Um, and AR, um, Going back to Encanto, we work in post, but in a similar fashion where we are doing our own VFX and then handing that off to the post team um, for final render renders. And then there's two uh, colors and playback which aren't really related, but I wanted to make sure I include them because color is so important on LED stages. Um, personally, like I'm not gonna teach you about color. I'm not good at it. I don't have a good eye for it. But our relationship with our DIT is really important in making sure that we're all working in lockstep. And then on the AR side, um, playback is really important. Knowing who's sending us time code, who's gonna trigger our effects, um, and having a good line of communication with them. So that is um, all the departments that you need to interact with um, and how they differ between AR and, and ICV effects, but are still kind of similar. Um, this is a sample technical pipeline, and I apologize to any vendors that weren't included on this, because I know a bunch of you are in the room. Um, but this uh, is a sample project um, of an AR project that we recently worked on, showing all the tools that we used um, from the planning stages, which are like the Nicole tools, uh, Miro, Sheets, Notion, um, which those kind of carry through as well, um, just like Perforce, which is along the bottom, our source control software. Um, we have a slew of 3D modeling softwares that we use. Um, the heart of most of our projects is with Unreal Engine, um, so you'll see that carried across um, when we're working on VFX, we work with Houdini to make procedural systems. Once we're on site, um, our personal preferred uh, tracking is Stipe. We have a very good relationship with them. Uh, we just share an office with them. Um, really nice guys. Um, as well as we use stage precision also, also to clean our, our tracking data sometimes, as well as um, add additional controls. And then in post-production, working with Unreal, Nuke, the Adobe Suite, um, and the, the reason I wanted to show this to you guys is because I'm not going to show you an IFC VFX workflow because it's exactly the same. We use the same tools. So if we're working in VAD, same modeling tools, same previs and Unreal, same execution on site, uh, including stage precision um, in, our, in our latest project as well. Um, next, I want to talk about staffing because it takes an army to, to make these projects happen. Um, these people are some of my closest friends. Um, when, when staffing a job, I want you guys to think about roles and hats. 
I stand here as an executive producer and manage projects. Um, but I also take some other hats within my company, which, you know, sometimes I'm editing marketing copy, sometimes I'm you know, t dealing with people's time off. Um, and the same thing happens on set, where you put someone in a seat and they are an Unreal Engine operator, but it really helps if they know about networking and they know about camera tracking. Um, we want to have overlaps in those skills. And when staffing a job, um, I tend to chronically overstaff my jobs, mostly because we work in beta. Um, so things go wrong all the time. Uh, we just really try not to show anybody that it's happening. Um, but if I have one guy who is digging into a problem in Unreal Engine and something else goes wrong, I need someone else to be able to jump in. I can't just have one, one operator. Um, so having teams with overlapping skills is really, really important. Um, as well as for contingency planning, um, co like COVID's still real um, and, and takes people out from jobs and making sure that you have enough staff to cover if you lose somebody is really important. Um, on my latest job, not the latest job, the, uh, a previous job, we had five people within the volume get COVID at the same time or within like the same week of each other. So that, like we got to a point where we almost had to shut down because we didn't have enough staff to do it and we had to make really comprehensive flow charts to explain if this, if X happens to this person, then why, then this other person can fill in for him. But if something happens to this guy, we have to fly somebody from Croatia to cover all the camera tracking because there's no one else who can cover it the way that that, that guy would have. Um, so having contingency planning within your staffing is also very, very important. Um, talking about skill sets, um, and this is, I'm sure, not a complete chart, um, but on the, in the vertical side over here, we have. Um, all, all sorts of roles that you'd fit within a virtual production project, whether it's uh, working as VAD, whether you're working on site, whether you're working in post. Um, along the top is a bunch of skill sets that you would need to have. Um, so animation, coding, understanding DMX, IT infrastructure. Um, and you can see here that there's, there's a lot of overlap within the skill sets. But what helps for us is that our team under, like, understands what each other is doing. Um, so I, I always say that when we're hiring, we're looking for breadth over depth. I want somebody who knows multiple softwares, has multiple skill sets, and can jump in when needed, rather than somebody who is only going to be able to do one thing. I don't need a one-trick pony. I need somebody who, like, when they see there's a problem, can jump in and help. Um, and this isn't like a fully complete list. This might also be a wish list, too, like, that I, I want my, I don't know. DevOps person to understand modeling software um, might be a little bit weird, but you know it's it's skill sets that the, that the people on our team do have as well. And if you see any errors in this, please come and see me because I will add extra boxes. And if you see a column that's missing, if you think there's a skill set that I didn't cover, please come and see me as well. Um, next up, um, I wanted to talk about team building. And again, like I said, these are my closest friends. Um, we spend a lot of time together. As I said earlier, we spent four months in an LED volume. Um, we were living out of hotels. We were living out of Airbnbs, Airbnbs together. Um, we, we get crammed into little tiny buses to get shuttled around to lunch, um, as well as um, if you look on the top left there, that is our Coachella truck from 2022, where there wasn't even enough room to walk between seats. Um, having a strong team and having like symbiosis within your team is incredibly important um, because you know, we rely on each other, and if one person is having a bad day, it can tank your whole team. And this is something I learned uh, really early with roller derby, was that like one bag, bad egg on the bench can like tank your whole game. Um, so being really protective of who you also bring into your team and how that messes with the, the flow and the feng shui of, of your organization. Um, again, uh, talking about um, breadth over depth, looking for people who can cover those skill sets. Um, also trying to build trust between these, two, these groups of people. A lot of times we have to take our project files and hand them off to someone else in the team for them to continue working with it. Um, one, you need to make sure that you know, the person who you're handing it off to, you're not handing them a mess. Like, make sure it's organized. Uh, have an understanding of how they're gonna need to use those files afterwards so that you're setting them up for success as well. And I think that's why I love working with such a small team is because I know that all of these guys have a comprehensive understanding of how their work affects somebody else on their team. Um, so you'll see us here in Zoom. We have a bunch of remote employees as well who are like our modelers and our technical artists um, who sometimes come out on job site, but a lot of times are far away. But you know, team building on Zoom is also important 
you know, opening lines of communication, creating that camaraderie. Um, yeah. And then to wrap, this is probably my last slide, actually. Um, I have some advice for inspiring producer. Um, my first one is be humble. VP is in its infantile state. Every production, like the roles are constantly changing. There's no qualifications to being like a VP supervisor or a VP producer. Um, so be honest about what you know and you don't know. Um, like I was on a job recently where I turned to my VP soup and I said, and I was acting as VAD supervisor, I said, I can help you with moving scenic stuff around. Um, I can help you with making sure that it looks the way that the director and the production designer want it to look. But when it comes to the camera and the lens and lighting and color, that is your game. Like, I am not going to get in your way. I want you to handle that. And being honest and transparent about where your strengths and weaknesses lies is really, really important. Because um, that also builds trust within your team as well. Um, knowing where you stop and end and knowing that um, that's where, where the handoff happens. Um, I worked with um, a gentleman named Mark Olson at PRG many, many years ago. And uh, I was on my first auto show. And the auto show lighting guys were like very particular about how they receive their equipment. And I was very stressed about it. And Mark was even stressed about it. But he gave me one piece of advice that always stuck with me. And he said, just don't lie to them. Don't tell them you know something that you don't know. They'll see right through it. Don't tell them that the gear is going to come by 3 p.m. if you don't think it's really going to come by 3 p.m. Give them realistic and, uh, and be honest with them because they're going to trust you. Um, the other thing about being humble is apologize and acknowledge when you're wrong. Um, I know a lot of people, um, especially within virtual production, sorry guys, um, have ego problems. <laughs> um, I think there's something about like having this massive LED wall and you can like do whatever you want with it that makes people feel really, really powerful. Um, but uh, yeah, shake that ego off. Um, realize that this is a team sport. We're, we're trying to be collaborative. Um, and yeah, just acknowledge um, when, when you've done something wrong and make sure that you, you make it right with those people because you're going to work with them again. Uh, fix it and pre is my next one. Um, you know, we, we all do virtual production so we can save money in post, um, which we also know is not always the case. Um, but when I say fix it and pre, um, I'm talking about scheduling. Make sure that you allow for enough time to get the job done that you need to. Um, and, and advocate for it. Like, make a schedule, put it in front of the producers, tell them, hey, on this day, I need this to be done and I need this from you. Um, a lot of times, we're working with productions who haven't worked in virtual production before and they don't know. Um, so give them a schedule and have them add it into their master schedule I don't let them keep virtual production separate from their main production. Like we should, we should all be functioning together. You saw earlier, there's so many interactions that we have to have interdepartmentally. And it really sucks when you're left off that call sheet and people don't even know you guys are in the room, but like you're doing a virtual production. So there's a, you know, a 95 foot LED wall behind you and they're, they just assume that you're not there. Um, but yeah, be tedious about your scheduling, make sure all your boxes are checked and, and advocate for that time you need. Um, educate everyone. Um, we have a motto at All of It Now called Everyone Teaches, Everybody Learns. Um, and we really like to try to share the knowledge that we do have. Um, I work really hard with our people about documentation, um, making sure that we, we, as we are troubleshooting, that we, we write down all the things that happen because you forget. Um, and then passing that knowledge on to the, the next person down the road. Um, uh, when I talk about education, I also mean educate your clients, educate your director, educate your DP. Make sure that they understand what they've bought into. Sometimes you'll have an executive producer of a project who really wanted to do virtual production, but you have a DP who's never done it before or isn't totally on board or is hesitant. But bring them in with open arms. Like, show them your world. So, like, we have a lot of fun. Um, and, I th and I think like the DPs that we've really like, taken under our wing and explained things to, we showed them previs, uh, really opened their eyes to the possibilities and made their lives easier in the end. Uh, the next one is anticipation. Anticipate every ask that you imagine come to you. And this also comes with experience um, in knowing, like, hey, can you make that blue? Um, is something that pops up, or hey, can you make that door slam? Um, you want to be able to anticipate what the next ask is going to be, because uh, it's only going to make you more prepared. And there's a lot of frustration in virtual production when, when things don't happen fast enough. So if you can anticipate what their asks are going to be, you're, you're golden. You're set up for success. Uh, 
Soft eyes is something that I picked up from roller derby, which I think is actually a football thing. Uh, but this is my number one tip as a producer. Um, earlier I said I, I usually stand in the back of the room. And what I'm doing in the back of the room is scanning, because a lot of my job is in planning, and that happens in pre. Um, and then once I get to job site, I stand in the back and I just keep soft eyes, meaning I don't focus on one person right in front of me. Sorry, Michael. Um, but I keep uh, soft eyes to the room so I can kind of see what's happening around me. I want to know what's happening in the periphery and I want to see problems before they come in. So sometimes I'll be standing there and I'll see, you know, someone bringing in a truss that has tracking markers on it, which it means recalibration. Um, and then I'll go over to my tracking guy and be like, hey, why don't you go talk to, to our grip over there and just walk back away, um, making sure that they also have the connections that are happening. Um, keeping soft eyes in the room to anticipate those problems. Also, uh, protecting your guys from distractions, uh, which brings me to my last point, which is protect your team. Um, a lot of times, like our Unreal Engine operators need to be able to focus. Um, they need to sit down and be able to work really hard, and they can't have people bugging them constantly. They can't have a VAD supervisor in one ear and the VP supervisor in the other and a director in the other and the DP in the other. Like, they don't have that many ears, um, <laughs> nor do they have the, the, the brain power to, to deal with it. Um, and something that I think is like the most important thing is just um, playing defense for your team, making like trying to intercept any of those problems that, before they come their way, trying to solve the problems before they make it, they make it their problem. Um, the other thing I want uh, in terms of protecting your team is um, overworking and burnout. A lot of times the film schedules that exist are built for standard production, and they don't realize that there's time needed before the production or after the production for us to set up or to wrap, um, or to troubleshoot problems for the next day. Um, so protect your team, advocate for the time that you need, because we don't need to be working 17 hour days, that's ridiculous. Like if the actors can have an eight hour day and the camera guy has a 10 hour day, like why are we working 14s? Like we, we can also make room for, for our time as well. Um, in protecting your team, um, also is making sure they eat, um, which sounds silly, but what I've noticed is that if you have a group of technicians and operators, essentially nerds, um, and they are not fed, they start to argue. Um, so making sure that people are well fed and like even budgeting for additional food money is really, really important because that's the thing that's gonna keep them happy. That's the thing that's gonna keep them working. A lot of times, you'll, you can have a guy who will sit, literally sit at a computer for 17, 18 hours, as long as you just keep bringing him, you know, Diet Cokes and sandwiches, grilled cheeses. Um, that's true. Um, and then uh, my last tip in protecting your team is, notice when your guys need a break. Um, notice when someone's in distress. Um, that is like a big thing that I don't think a lot of people realize. And this goes back to that, like, like, um, like, you can't have like a weak chain in your link. If someone, and in, in, like having a bad attitude tank your bench. If someone's in distress, it could also bleed through and infect the rest of your staff. Um, so being aware of when your guys need a break, when they need to take some time off, um, when they just need a, a minute to step outside and yell, um, it's, it's okay. Um, but just being aware of, of your team's needs, of how they're feeling, because uh, we, like, Virtual production is a lot of fun, but we, we have to maintain that. And I feel like my job as a producer is also in making sure the team's happy, that they're able to do their jobs. Um, there's one that I forgot to put on here, and this will be my last uh, advice for aspiring producers, is find good partners. Find people you can trust. Find people who, when you don't have the knowledge base, can cover those gaps. Um, find somebody who you know that, like, if you're in a stressful situation, will pick up the phone at midnight and help you out. Um, and this also goes as well, not just for internally within your team as partners, um, but also with your vendors as well. Find vendors who you know are gonna support you, who are gonna pick up the phone when you have problems and establish those relationships. And that is it. Um, I just wanna thank everybody for your time. Again, if you saw any errors in any of my charts, please let me know. I'm very open to that discussion. Um, and I just wanna thank you guys for the time. I have a question. Can I have my microphone? <laughs> Check.
Can you open up my mic? I know. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I rapped earlier than I was supposed no, to. No, no, you're the great. The microphones you're aren't great. ready. <laughs> um, can can okay. I have my mic? Sorry. Can I have my mic? Check. Am I up? Okay. I, I'm going to ask the first question. Um, your slide, I just want to call out for everyone in the room. As an executive producer, it is so meaningful to me that the top point in your advice was to be humble. I think that is so powerful. You can, you can get a lot done with an open heart and a little humility. And I just want to say thank you for pointing that out. So my question in that is, have you changed hearts and minds around you, like softened a brick wall because people see that in you when you are leading as an executive producer? Yes, I, I've definitely seen the staff change. Um, and I apologize if he's watching right now. But I had uh, somebody a, a year or two ago um, turn to me and say, when I asked him a question, go, well, that's not going to happen. And I slammed my iPad shut, and I walked off, off out of the truck, and I was like, I can't deal with this right now. Um, and after that job, I was like, I don't know if we're going to have him back on set. I don't know if he's, he's the right fit. Um, and I've, I've seen him turn around. Um, and I've seen him also take that, that piece of humble pie and, and change who he is as well. Um, and now he is one of my favorite operators, and I would not do a job without him. Great. Uh, questions in the room? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the interesting presentation, and you showed us the differences and synergies between ICFX and AR. What about doing both? So did you ever film in front of an LED volume and did AR on top, and is this a thing in the industry? Yeah, it's called XR. Uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people forget that set extension is an AR element. Um, and honestly, like we have this joke um, that we go, I don't want to XR, or you guys wanted to XR, we didn't want to XR. And it's because color calibration is really, really hard between the color that's coming out of your LED and the color of your, your AR set extension layer. Um, so that happens very, very often. And I'm sure JT and team here does it, do it all the time. Thanks. Other questions? Down in the front, please. Hi. Hey, Shelly. Hi, Nicole. Um, I'm curious about what your experience was like going into um, a film set that had people that hadn't really worked with the technology before and what it was like dealing with those kinds of, you know, did you find yourself approaching it differently? Do you have an introduction of oh, the world to any, you know? Yeah, well, my first experience with XR Productions and, and having to work directly with directors and DPs was after watching a day of them turning off their comp and not looking at it at all and then having a lot of messed up footage, um, having to have a meeting the following morning and say, hey guys, these are your limitations. Um, and I think part of that was an interesting growth on my own part that I didn't realize that I had the power within me to speak up to that group of people. Um, like very, very intimidating to like come in as like a production manager who only deals with the technology side of things and have the guts to say, hey, like this is how it has to be done. Um, and I think like that was the moment where like I found this grit within myself and like I, the world hasn't been the same since. Um, I think also like you come in educating more um, because of that, like you learn from that experience and you make sure that you're, you're preparing people mentally um, as they're coming into your space and invite them into your world, show them what the toys are, show them how to have fun with it. I have one other follow up to that, which is um, the title of, you know, what you call yourself. You know, I think it's interesting because it's so many different things. And, you know, would you just call yourself a producer, a technical producer, a well, creative producer, a translator? What is it? <laughs> like master communicator. Um, it was when, when Danny hired me, he handed me a job description that said executive producer. And uh, I called up Wyatt from Lux and I was like, Wyatt, what does a producer do? <laughs> like, like, I know that's your title. And his answer to me was, you don't let the job fail. Um, and I, th I think that's 
that's what I bring to the table as well, is like keeping a holistic eye on the production as a whole um, and making sure that you know, there's never any, any weaknesses within that. Other questions? Anything from our online chat? All right, thank you, Nicole. It's really thank great. You guys. Uh, no